judge reverses decision, allows Covington Catholic school student Nick Sandman to sue the Washington Post. Stick that in your Bezos and smoke it, mainstream media. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to the Dr. Duke Show, the only program on the interwebs that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms, college campuses, grad programs, theological seminaries all across the world. Today we're discussing a poll that finds a majority of Americans want the First Amendment rewritten. Plus, a group of students at the University of Connecticut want the school to become more black and force all students to attend a course on racism and hate crimes. But we start with a stunning reversal of Covington Catholic student Nick Sandman's lawsuit, potential lawsuit, suit against the Washington Post. Now, a judge initially threw this out, and then uh, uh, the, the potential filing was, re- was rewritten a little bit and resubmitted, and a federal judge in Kentucky has now reopened the Covington Catholic high school students' $250 million defamation lawsuit against the Washington Post, which is pretty rega- pretty remarkable, right? The judge said after reviewing an amended complaint, uh, this is Judge William Bertelsman, ordered that the case could enter the discovery phase, and hence, a portion of the lawsuit against the newspaper could continue. And this is really important. This was reported on by the Cincinnati Inquirer. By allowing them to do this, uh, to, to, to get into the discovery process, Sandman's lawyers now can legally uh, request things from the Washington Post. They could literally get information, have to get, the Washington Post is going to have to hand over information that's going to make this a much more interesting case for Nick Sandman. It will be quite interesting because once, you know, you say the discovery phase, that opens up a whole can of worms of what could be discovered. And I'm sure Washington Post is, you know, quivering in its uh, little newsrooms over there. But basically what had happened originally is that, um, It's been limited in the scope because the judge said that 30 out of the 33 statements that Sandman's lawyer had argued were libelous were not actually libelous, but that's 30 out of 33. It just takes one. They've got a couple more to work with. Um, But the inquirer did say that the judge's order that discovery can continue means his legal team can make the request, as you said. And that's the big key thing here is because the Washington Post, like a lot of these news organizations, like to hide everything and use anonymous sources as they do for everything. So it'll be interesting to see what their emails say and all the internal communication. So that's where you should be focusing to, to, as we move forward. And it's frustrating this. that, you know, the judge had decided that 30 of the 33 weren't libelous without having seen any context for it, which strikes me as a unjudgely thing to do. It's certainly there's enough smoke here, and certainly the consequences of what the Washington Post did had an immediate impact on the life of Nick Sandman. And so the idea that the, the judge would have initially dismissed almost all of it without any attempt to find out the context in which the Washington Post was working and making these, these – makes it basically making things up about Nick Sandman. Sandman, well, at least we're back here now, and what the Washington Post has is going to have to be turned over. So I think it looks good. I don't know. I mean, libel's a very difficult thing to prove. It really, really is. Uh, And judges like this one are going to be overly cautious uh, in protecting particularly the press, right? Mm -hmm. If it was the other way around, if it were an individual citizen who had done this, I think it would be a lot easier to prove and do something about. But in this case, uh, the Post is hiding behind its fourth rail uh, protections here, which is interesting. But we'll see. I mean, it's back on the – and this should also make some of the other uh, organizations that Sandman Sandman is suing a little bit nervous too. Yeah, you would hope that everyone will awaken to what's happening with this case. But alas, it's America, and we don't like to pay attention to things. But we do have our opinions about everything, even though we don't know what's going on. And now we're finding the majority opinion of Americans is that the First Amendment should be rewritten. There's a new poll called the Campaign for Free Speech, and it found that more than half of Americans want the First Amendment rewritten. 51% think that the amendment is outdated, probably because they're like, well, that was like so long ago they wrote it, so clearly. It was like 100 years ago, man. man. It's like 100 years old. Well, they've surveyed a whopping 1,004 people, so just over 500 people were like, hey, man, it's old. Anyway, uh, young people were the most likely, 
shocking, to uh, support curbing free expression and punishing those who engage in, quote, hate speech. And the fact that you got to put hate speech in quotation marks, both <laughs> literally and figuratively, figuratively, means the founding fathers were right. Once you, do, <laughs> once you put the air quotes around hate speech, that means it's anything the left doesn't exactly. like, anything a university doesn't like, anything a left-wing newspaper doesn't like, anything Nancy Pelosi doesn't <laughs> like, is now hate speech. Of course. And nearly 60% of millennials who Mm. they're claiming are ages 21 through 38, so my generation, agreed that the Constitution, quote, goes too far in allowing hate speech in modern America. Now, I've read my Constitution. I I looked back through it. Going too far, hate speech in America. I was looking through the document, and I didn't see that terminology in there. No, and I would say this, and I mean this definitively. There is no, there is much less hate speech in a mil, in a in a country of 350 million. There is much less hate speech than there ever has been in the history of this nation. There is much more sensitivity towards speech to the point of almost repression, uh, to the point of censorship, and then we've ever had before in the history of this country. And what you're doing is going backwards here, right? You are you are using a straw man, the idea that everybody's running around outside of rappers and African-Americans talking to each other in movies, right? The N-word is not terribly popular. If we could just cut down on the rappers, right, and the, the NBA players using it on each other, we would probably have eliminated the entire word. So if you want to go after somebody, how about you just censor the rappers? How about that? Let's just censor the people who are using the word, the N-word, with great impunity and then fix the problem and leave the rest of us to our free speech. Yeah, well, in speaking of the rest of us, I don't want everyone just to be like, oh, those millennials, even though I do that a lot. Uh, those Gen Xers, they had 48% of them who said the First Amendment should be rewritten. And you boomers out there, you baby boomers, Forty-seven percent. It's not like you know. It's twenty-two percent of you or something. So everyone is right up there at well, half of America. We, sh- we should be really grateful of one thing: that these these people who want the First Amendment rewritten have no idea that freedom of religion is in there is, as well. They don't. They, they don't even know it's there. They, they have the exactly. vaguest idea. If they knew, forty and fifty it's, and sixty percent of them would have wanted the, the First Amendment re- revised to get rid of religious liberty when it comes to speech. They found that eighty percent, a full eighty percent of Americans actually don't know what the First Amendment exactly. actually protects. So th- or, I'm not going to listen Or what to it. it says. Oh, the, no, no. So half the country wants to change an amendment that they, they haven't have read. No they have no idea what it says. So the ones who were polled believed this statement to be true. The First Amendment allows anyone to say their opinion no matter what, and they are protected by law from any consequences of saying those thoughts or opinions. Which, of course, isn't true. No. The only thing is is that you, the government can't be a there consequence, it is. right? Which they don't know. And I guarantee no, no. you, if most of them had recognized that, the numbers Ugh. would be low. Even in this day and age, the numbers would have been lower. Yeah. <sighs> and then... And then <sighs> Let's talk about free press because we were just talking about that. That's also a First Amendment. which are, What? Which, That's in the which, First Amendment exactly, too? Exactly. Which our little millennials know nothing about. Hey, not just them. Not just them. Gen Xers and boomers. I'm mm. putting everyone in there. We all are horrible. All right. Many of all the generations would also like to see a crackdown on the free press. Nearly 60% of respondents agreed that the government should be able to take action at against newspapers and TV stations that publish content that is biased, inflammatory, mm-hmm. or false. Now, 59 of that 60% thinks, is thinking Fox News, right? Yeah. <laughs> because once again, the government gets to take action against false news. Yes. And we all know that would never apply to MSNBC, no, would always, never apply to CNN, right? All... So this is how it works, right? We'll sit by and watch as progressives when every non-progressive site speech form of speech is censored and we'll pat ourselves on the shoulder for being so utterly smug and then when they come for you because they're gonna come come for for you you. then you'll whine like stuck little piggies and have to deal with it right all the way speaking of the piggies i was gonna say 1984 but animal farm as well read george orwell if you want to understand what we're talking about right here with free press free speech hate crimes hate speech all of it or just listen to george harrison's song piggies from the white album 19 (laughs) have you seen the little piggies in their starched white shirts right we're not gonna do that piggies they're piggies it's true these are these are anti-freedom piggies all right, well, we're, we're us millennials, I guess, if we're going to just attack the millennials. Where we're learning all of this is obviously on the college campus, and there's another survey, this year's survey of the campus free speech experts, where they ask people, hey, what do you find important about, you know, how is the campus speech climate 
uh, going. And Real Clear Education did this survey. So they wanted to find out what's happening on these college campuses with how free speech is handled throughout. And they wanted to get opinions of the experts, people who are, you know, professors on the campus, people who cover this in the media, people who actually pay attention, essentially. And they invited 70 different academics, pundits, policy experts. 22 of them completed this survey. So they got responses from uh, 22 different people asking them of all the campuses across the nation, which ones actually allow for free speech? Who are the best, basically, campuses to do this? And who are the, the top five, Dr. Duke? Purdue. University of Chicago, Princeton, University of Virginia, Arizona State, and Claremont McKenna. So, I mean, you know, some interesting people. University of Chicago, we know, has long been uh, at least trying to fight intellectually the good fight. They're facing some protests as well. Purdue surprises me because Purdue's been in the news for some negative issues lately. It's my, well, my alma mater for my PhD. Princeton, um, and surprisingly, that only one Ivy League school here. As a matter of mm-hmm. fact, perhaps more interesting, yep. uh, or as interesting, are the seven worst schools, schools for free speech. Yale. Harvard, Williams, DePaul, Liberty. Liberty. Liberty University. Mm-hmm. Oberlin College, to the surprise of nobody, and Brown. <laughs> Brown. So yeah. three of the four are all Ivy League schools, right? Absolutely. And I guarantee you Liberty is included in here, probably from the other way, right? The idea that there, as I would assume that Liberty's here, because as a Christian school, the implication is, is that they're cracking down on speech that is too anti-Christian? Well, they've been in the news lately about what people who work there can say and that's can't right. say and stuff. So yeah, And that's coming from pressures within the university right. itself. So we'll, we'll see with that. It's interesting what, that they're included. Yeah, but in, in a lot of the of the 22, a lot of them are more, I guess, the experts. They do say are more conservative-leaning because they're more paying attention to this whole free speech and, and hate speech and what all that means because it affects them more. But there are professors from NYU who, you know, just if you're a professor at NYU, that these things, conservative or free speech, they just don't seem to combine. But in this instance, they do. Jonathan Haidt said why he thinks that campus free speech climate, you know, why looking at it is so important is he says because of a lack of viewpoint diversity, policies are implemented to promote ends that are sometimes antithetical to free inquiry and Socratic spirit. Oh, my gosh, Socratic spirit. Um, For example, at my university, we have a biased response line. Students are encouraged to anonymously report anyone who says anything that offends them. So as a professor, I no longer take risks. I must teach to the most easily offended student in the class. I therefore avoid saying anything or doing anything provocative, my classes are less fun and engaging. Well, it's a shame that a professor of his status would have to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't. I mean, and, and <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't do that. I mean, we, we don't have formally a biased response team, but we have the equivalent of it. Anybody can report anybody for any reason. Uh, I don't. I say what I think, and it gets me in trouble all the time. And that's with you even at the beginning of the semester doing your... All, all my contracts. Contract. It's still, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that the answer is for the handful of conservative professors who are left to just admit publicly that they stop doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, on the one hand, good for you, Jonathan Haidt, that you're talking about this. On the other hand, aren't you part of the problem when you're conforming to it? Uh, I take Robert, the, as we round out this segment, uh, Robert, Robbie George, right? Perhaps uh, prof- one of the most famous advocates for free speech in the country, one of the most well-known professors uh, who is out there defending free speech. Robbie George said, I think this sums it up, quote, freedom of thought and speech are the oxygen of the life of the mind. You cut off the oxygen to the brain of free speech. To, of, of, you cut off the oxygen of free speech to the educational parameters of universities, and the brain suffocates. And that's what's happening in our schools. We are, by cutting off the oxygen that is free speech, we are literally killing our own brains. We're killing our own intellectual endeavors. And that's what's happening at the University of Connecticut, where the student chapter of the NAACP has released a set of demands for their campus um, after basically what happened was a video surfaced and it was posted to social media and it had three students, supposedly three students who were from Yukon and they were walking through a school parking lot and two of them were shouting the N word. And those students were later arrested for what they did um, for charges of ridicule. Yeah, wait a second. They were arrested for the charge of ridicule. ridicule. Uh, involving racist speech. Okay. okay, so that's the situation. So now the student chapter group is going to punish the university and all the students there for what these 
two to three individuals may have done. The group wants more. They said they demand that the university issue a public statement condemning acts of racism on campus. That's number one. They want to institute a large cluster hire of black administration, faculty, staff, and police officers. Mm -hmm. Number two, the school uh, needs to implement a required first year course that addresses diversity, racism, and hate crimes. It's number three that they're demanding. And there's more. They are calling on the university to consult with the NAACP, the big group, not their student group, but, you know, the higher ups, to create specific guidelines and consequences in its student code of conduct for hate speech, including punishments for racism, hate speech directed at individuals in public and or private areas. The best thing that ever happened to social justice warriors is the rare moment when they can find an actual incidence of somebody using a word they don't like. Once it happens, then notice what notice the disproportionality, right? Uh, so, so we don't even know if these were necessarily students, do we? They said they were students, but I watched the video, and it, it's kind of hard to see when you see it. What race are they? They said they're white. Right. They claim That's to be right. white, but... But, but again, I mean, we, we had a situation where we had a, a homeless woman on a campus yeah. screaming, screaming obscenities. Which, In Boulder, I want to right, say? Right. I want to say Colorado. Colorado. A homeless woman who is not part of the university mm -hmm. making screaming slurs in her lunacy on campus, which triggered this kind of reform, mm -hmm. right? Some daft homeless woman wanders onto campus, makes a few remarks, and suddenly systemic racism. Of course. Th this is... This is a racket is what this is. I mean, this is just take everything, a cluster, not just a cluster of black administration, because, you know, simply the color of your skin. Determines. Right? Yeah. Determines immediately. If you're black, Absolutely. you're good to go. As we said in the previous segment, if you're black and using the N-word, well, that's we're perfectly down with that, right? But to be black and an administrator means that we have fixed the problem. But that, that sensitivity, somehow white liberals with all of their gerrymandering of universities don't care enough. Of course. Right? They haven't changed enough. So let's just make universities, let's just make them now institutes of social justice and be done with it. Let's not even pretend anymore we're going to do anything else, that the primary purpose of universities now is social engineering. Yeah, and the little cherry on the top of this Sunday, if we're allowed to even say cherry on top of a Sunday, I'm sure that's offensive to someone. Um, to the lactose intolerant. Probably. That's a good point. The university is currently looking for a chief diversity officer mm. to help when these types of issues happen in UConn. Yeah, so, I mean, you need a team to deal with this, do don't you? You got a couple a of idiots. You got to have a cluster. And what do they call that in an army? A cluster? Never mind. <laughs> but you got to have a team, right? It's not enough to have dozens and dozens and dozens of, of diversity officers. It doesn't help you to have a completely woke liberal faculty. It doesn't help. It's not enough that you're censoring conservative speech. You've got to have a cluster team, right? And so it gets more expensive and it gets more repressive and it gets more irrelevant and it gets more reactionary every day. And uh, that's where we are. And I'm more depressed, but it will close out our day, so I guess that leaves me a little bit happier. As always, please share the episode and subscribe to the free audio podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else. Just visit drdukeshow.com and click on any of the platforms on the top to subscribe. And that's it for us. And if you like the show, please consider supporting it by signing up for our Patriot Club. 25 bucks a month keeps us rolling and no clusters. There will be no clusters. We will, I promise you the Dr. Duke Show will not spend your hard-earned $25 a month hiring clusters of diversity officers to magnify our own sins and to police the show. I promise you we won't do that. Visit the, in fact, pay us $25. Oh, ransom. Pay us 25 bucks a month or we're going to start hiring diversity clusters to torment you. Jeez. Visit drdukeshow.com to get started. We'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time with an always entertaining episode of The Dr. Duke Show for Freedom Project. I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And I've got to tell you, despite what's going on in the universities, you got to stay educated, my friends. Stay educated, my friends. Mm -hmm.